If you're a residential real estate agent earning $200,000 a year and you want to grow your passive income, this show's for you. Learn the secrets other agents use and hear from experts in our field in order to guide you along your journey to investing in assets like apartment communities so that you can turn your commissions into cash flow. I'm Randall DeCleared. Let's go, baby. All right, all right. Welcome back, agents. We're building cash flow together. Let's get this show going. I'm happy to have Harry DiOrio on the show today. Uh, he's a founder of the Harry DiOrio team, and uh, he's an accomplished real estate professional. He's been in the business since 2003. Uh, he sold properties in every category uh, and price range in the New York, and, in the, and now he's in the Florida market as well. So he's leading uh, a group of talented agents in, in New York, and I think he says he's, he's joined a team down in, in Florida as well. So he's licensed in multiple states. On the show today, we're going to discuss the usual. You know, we talk about the market. Um, he has a unique insight in the Florida and the New York markets. So we talk about what he's seeing there. We talk about uh, what he's doing to win some deals. And we talk about his prior career, which was a, a award-winning photojournalist, which is very cool just in its own right, and how that assisted him when he was early stage in his real estate brokerage career to actually win listings uh, when he was new to want the New York market and new to real estate. So it helped him get deals very quickly because he had a, a, an additional skill set. So very interesting individual, multifaceted. He's got a diverse set of interests, which is always great to talk to somebody like him. He loves sailing. He's a pilot. He likes to ski, cook, and, and so many things. So join us as we delve into Harry's you know, unique set of experiences and his wealth of insights. And, uh, and let's get this show going. Let's go. So, all right, Harry, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. I know you are a top producer. You're in the New York and Florida markets, and uh, it seems like you are killing it. So really grateful for you jumping on the show with us. Um, let's dive right in. I want to get some backstory on how you got into real estate in the first place. You and I were just talking off air. We were talking about how you were in, um, you were in media and you were in the print and photography side. So can you kind of give me the backstory there and then, and then transition that, how you got into real estate from there? Sure. Um, well, thanks, Randall, for having me on the show. So basically, I was um, in the newspaper business and as a photojournalist and a photo editor, director of photography, and then a assistant managing editor at a newspaper. And the newspaper paid for me to get my MBA, which was very generous of them. But when I first, early on, when I first bought my first house, I bought a two-family house because I wanted the income, you know, from the uh, other apartment to offset the mortgage. And then I decided to buy another one and I moved to the new one and then rented out the former house. And it was great. You know, I had had cash flow and I had depreciation and it was great. And what happened was I had no plan of leaving the media business. But I I got back together with an old girlfriend who's now my wife, and she was living in New York City. And I was in Syracuse, had a great job and great situation. But she worked in the financial business, and there weren't really jobs for her in Syracuse, not ones that paid the kind of pay that money that she was making. So I decided I would move to New York. And I started to look for for jobs in the media world. And, and, you know, I got some great offers, honestly, um, but they didn't, they were great jobs, but they didn't pay very much. So as part of this process, I decided this, I need to sell my houses to move to New York. And so I listed them with this agent, uh, Janet Wenzel, who really was a great agent. And, <laughs> And, you know, in the process of, of selling the homes, I started thinking about getting my real estate license. But before I did that, in the way I ended up doing the real estate thing was that I, I basically made what I called a selfish list, which is all the stuff I like, cars, boats, airplanes, food, real estate, a variety of other things. And I made this list. And then back in the day, you know, this is before uh, the internet was what it is now. I went through the New York Times job section every 
every Sunday. And I basically circled the jobs that I thought would be interesting and which might pay more than being a photo editor. And so as, as I went through that process, I, I thought, you know, real estate sounds exciting. Sounds, and also, you know, in residential real estate, you, you control your own schedule, which means you work 24 seven. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you control your, your yeah. own schedule. So I thought, oh, this is great. I'll still be able to shoot pictures and still have, you know, my photo thing going. Uh, so basically, I got my real estate license before I moved to New York. And then I moved to New York. And Friday, I was a direct, I was an assistant managing editor at a newspaper. And then on Monday, I was a real estate broker in Manhattan. And, you know, just took off from there. I did a lot of freelance work. And then what happened was the more apartments I sold, the fewer pictures I shot just because it made more sense to sell apartments than to do assignments for magazines and newspapers, which basically paid the same amount of money as when I was in college. So, so, but I had a great, a great gig. I was the USTA's photographer for the U.S. Open Tennis through Getty Images and great success in photography. And I love photography, but uh, thank God I got out of the business because I, who knew it was like a, it was a sinking ship, the whole newspaper, you know, media world, or, you know, from a, at least uh, from what they pay photographers. Now. When, when when was that? Yeah, when was it? Because photography has always been something that that um, I've enjoyed. And and then obviously with the iPhone and everybody having a camera and and all of that. So like when when did you get out of? Uh, Two thousand three. So it's pre iPhone, and certainly the iPhone and the ease of taking pictures really lowered the bar yeah. for photography and photojournalism. And it changed uh, the way things are done at publications. Um, yeah. uh, a lot uh, of reporters uh, shoot their own pictures. And it's at any rate, it's just the business also, the loss of circulation and then followed by the layoffs and the loss of advertising and all that stuff was just a downward spiral. Yeah. So I was lucky to make the decision I made, although it, it wasn't because I disliked the business I was in, it's just that it, it the numbers didn't work for Manhattan. And so yeah. I, I decided to make the switch. So, so and I, the photography thing helped me out a lot initially, because back then there, there wasn't HDR photography where you can shoot pictures without lighting things and you can put a whole bunch of crappy pictures together, and make a good one out of it yeah. that, that people use now for real estate photography. So because I was able to shoot high quality images for my listings, it made a big difference. Because first start out, if, you know, you're likely not going to get the trophy listings unless you really know people who want to sell trophy listings, and and they trust you to do it, even though you haven't done anything before. Yet you usually end up with you know smaller, less more humble yeah. uh, properties, and those people those brokers didn't have the budget to hire photographers to shoot these things. So I was, able to, yeah, I was able to differentiate myself with the photography when I first got into the business. And now you can hire a photographer to shoot, you know, interiors and do all of the stuff that, you know, it takes hours before they come in and they bang off these shots and it's very inexpensive on a relative basis. Yeah. compared to 2003 so yeah we're getting some done today it's like 200 dollars, and in one of our listings we're you know it's just they're in and out in an hour or two with drone yeah, shots you know <laughs> it's yeah, like the whole it's, deal it's uh, a different world and that was part i i even after i stopped shooting professionally for wire services magazines and newspapers and uh freelancing basically before I stopped doing that professionally, I was still, or after I stopped doing professional, I should say, I was still shooting my interiors just because I liked doing it. And, yeah. and I was working with a real estate coach and she was telling me, every time you shoot pictures, you're losing money. <laughs> you're not prospecting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she don't have any joy. Just go, go prospect. <laughs> yeah. And also, yeah, exactly. But 
I, you know, I continued doing it for a while, and yeah. then finally I I just stopped. So, yeah. well, let, I mean, I still see. shoot pictures, right? I mean, yeah. I, I have What's the your scale camera that you use. I have a Nikon. I have Nikon equipment. I have everything from a a fourteen millimeter to a four hundred two eight, but my uh, my photo device of choice now is the iPhone. Yeah. Uh, like this case, it has a lens cover. Yeah. Keeps it nice and clean. It's a very important part of getting good iPhone photos. Yeah. Having a clean lens. But anyways, yeah, I, um, well, you know, the new iPhones are so incredible. Yeah, for you sure. Know, I, well, let's talk, let's talk, uh, let's talk real estate. So you got into real estate and, and this was around 2003 and, and so like very curious, new, new to the market, new to real estate in general. So what were some of the things that, that you did that were winning you business at an early stage in your career? Initially, I worked for a small firm that allowed us to put open listings, open listings are for sale by owner listings on the website. And that was, I was, I called up these for sale by owners and said, Hey, would you mind if I put it on the website and you know, would you pay me a commission if I, if I find a buyer and you know, most of them said yes. So the, the first day I was in the business, I went to, I was reading the employee manual and I went over to the sales manager and I said, yeah, I was reading the employee manual and I saw that, you know, if I could get a for sale by owner to let me do an open house that you would put an ad in the New York Times. She goes, why are you reading the employee manual? I said, I don't know, it's my first day here, my first day in the business. And she took this big stack of papers fax they used to get them by fax and yeah. she slapped them on the desk and she said these are open listings start calling them and i said what am i going to say you tell them you want to you want their listing and if they won't give you the listing if they would let you put it on the website they would pay you a commission and well most of them didn't want to give me the listing uh or really none of them at, the, at that time i was able to go in there and shoot you know, really high quality photos that, you know, looked like real, well, they were professional photos that was huge for me. So I, I figured, well, I'll start with the, it was an open listing for 7.3 million. Or I was like, I called them up at the bears for this like killer building in New York. And they said, oh yeah, come over. And I, so I figured, oh, what the hell? I went over there and shot some pictures and I just, I set up all these different, appointments and I went and shot pictures and got the information. And by the end of the week, I had like a website that looked like one of the top agents. I had a $7 million listing, you know, yeah. I had a, you know, people who were looking at the web, you know, just saw listings. Back then the web was pretty rudimentary. There wasn't any yeah. Zillow or Street Easy or any of these things, you know, that we have now, these aggregators. And so nonetheless, I basically had a great the guy who owned the company did these training sessions and he really helped me to become a salesman because a lot of what we do and, you know, is selling, right? So, you know, there's marketing, there's all kinds of stuff, you know, that's involved in the real estate world, but, you know, certainly uh, he was a great trainer on, on selling things in general. And he really taught me a lot. And so when I had my first phone call from one of my open listings, he had done this, you know, so I was in the business a week. Okay. And I got my first phone call off of one of my listings, my yep. open listings. I'm in business now. Yeah. And, and basically he had said to me during this training session, if you get an out of town client, you run them around until they drop. As soon as you stop, we're going to be running around with someone else. Mm -hmm. So these people call me. I, you know, on this open listing, I said, do you want me to set up a tour for you when you're going to be in town? They said, yes. Yeah. So I said, how long are you going to be here? They said, oh, we're going to be there Saturday and Sunday. I said, oh, no problem. So all day Saturday, all day Sunday, I showed them properties. And then at the end of the day on Sunday, they put in 
an offer on this one place they liked, they got it and had my first deal two weeks nice. into the business, which yeah, is that's solid. And then a couple of weeks later, I got another deal and and I was off and running. And then after I had done a few deals, I had you know contacted this woman who was a a sales manager at Douglas Salomon. I I was calling her because she had been an agent before. And she said, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm a sales manager now. This other person has the listing. And she's and I said, Okay, great. She goes, Well, but since you called me, she said, you know, I think you're looking at, you know, you know, your bio. I think you'd be a great agent. You want to come in and talk to me. And she was at this firm in New York City called Douglas Salomon. Yeah. Big firm. And so I ended up moving over to Douglas Salomon and, you know, it, it was helpful to have that the brand behind me to get listings at that point because um, I didn't have my own brand yet. Yeah. Uh, so now I have my own brand. It really doesn't matter which firm I'm at. Let's, I'm let's, at, yeah, let's yeah. talk about that. I'm kind of curious. So the transition, I mean, that was early days. So now, obviously, the uh, market is completely different. Your experience level is is through the roof now. You have put in your 10,000 hours, I'm sure, uh, since 2003. So, yeah, like what are you? what does your team look like now? And, and I know you're in Florida and in New York. And so I wanted to talk to you about that. Like how do you manage the workflow in, in two different markets? And uh, just a string of questions about, about that in general. But I, I want to say some time so we get into to talking investments. But yeah, how did, how did you, uh, w- what does your team look like now? And like, how do you manage those two markets? Yeah, so, you know, my primary business is in New York and, and Florida is my new business, so to speak. So I'm starting out again down here because it's not like some people whose business is very transportable. Real estate's really a, a local business, right? Yeah. So not that it's, your skills are transportable, but your client base is often not, right? Yeah. Although there's a lot of, you know, interconnections and stuff. Between a, I was kind of wondering if your client base in, in New York is looking for a retirement home or that's oh, yeah. sort of like second home, you know? I was like, it it's, seems like it, that's a... It's definitely a big factor. A lot yeah. of people from New York are moving to Florida. But anyway, my my primary uh, business is in New York, where I have a team. I have um, there's four of us and a full time assistant, and so basically, um, I have the you know I do the majority of business and and I give leads to these other agents. And when I get listings, uh, um, which I've you know quite a few listings, I I assign one agent to each listing. And they get a percentage of the commission. And that way, if I'm in Florida uh, or anywhere else, because uh, if I'm traveling, it gives me an opportunity to have a regular life. Yeah. You know, I have coverage, right? So so between the four of us, we are able to, you know, to cover all these listings. And so whereas in Florida, I'm actually on a team. So I have a friend who represented us when we bought our house down here. And he was, he's from New York. He worked for Brown Harris Stevens in New York City. And um, and so at any rate, when we were thinking about buying a, a place in Florida, I gave him a buzz. He's a compass where I'm also a compass now. And a great firm, by the way. Uh, and, and basically, um, I contacted him and he helped us with our purchase here. His name's Peter Arner. And so basically when it came time to expand my business to Florida, I joined his team. Basically I need support here in Florida too. And also because things are done differently in Florida and, you know, there is an education process involved. So I, I actually, you know, I got my license and then I, I didn't really expand my business to Florida because I was worried that people in New York would think, oh, he's moved to Florida. I'm not going to list my yeah. place, with him, you know, and and then basically I was talking to some other agents about this whole thing. And they said, 
Dude, if you want to expand your business to Florida, you can't be a secret agent. Yeah. <laughs> you have to tell people. And so I made an announcement video, which is really, really nice. I had this, I have this guy down here in Florida who does all my pictures, my listings and videos and whatnot. And he did this announcement video for me and and it was great. And I sent it out to everyone. And the reaction was overwhelmingly positive, you know? Yeah. yeah. And um, so after I made my announcement, I got a listing like a month later and then I got another listing and um, I sold the first one. The second one's in contract now and you know, I have a buyer. I wanted my my cousin wants to buy a place. You know, it turns out, uh, you know, everyone in New York uh, is looking to buy a place in Florida. Yeah. Not everyone, yeah, that's but a lot of people. And so it worked out that's very well. And yeah, so we'll see how that all pans out in the long run uh but you know florida is a great market it's growing like mad the you know there was the feeding frenzy of the pandemic which you know made you might think it was a good market but what it was was a crazy market where you know if you were a seller it was a good market you know unless you had a, unless you then after you sold you wanted to buy something exactly the <laughs> buyer it wasn't a good market it wasn't a good market because really market you know, markets are transactions. So when people come together and they make a deal, you have a market. You can have a high price and a bad market and a low price and a good market. It's just a question is, are transactions occurring? And the fact was that in Florida, the transactions were hard to come by because there was nothing, you know, there was nothing to sell. Yeah. Um, whereas in New York City, we had a great market. Everyone thinks, oh, the market in New York was crap. It's horrible. There was so much inventory and prices were down. And I'm like, yeah, but we had deals, right? And a, a market is deals. Yeah, it's for not sure. Price, you so, know? So, so I'm curious about that then in New York. So why why do you think that it stayed active uh, just this we year? We had inventory. Volume? Yeah. And the prices were attractive. There were deals to be made. People yeah. were negotiable um, until they weren't when the market really heated up in 2021. And then it became less negotiable. But still, there was still, you know, the price was still below peak. We're still selling below peak. I mean, the peak of the New York market was like 2015. Mm. And quite honestly, if you bought something in 2015 and you're selling it today in New York City, it's a good possibility you're actually going to sell for less than you paid for it. Really? It's still but, that high? Um, well, you know, the, the pandemic hit New York harder than most other places. Yeah. And also the, what happened originally was the tax bill that eliminated the salt deduction, which really hurt our market. That So people started moving because of the tax bill a long time ago before the pandemic. And then the pandemic came along and really accelerated it. So it's like the New York market in 2019, early 2020, was just recovering from this tax bill thing. People were finally, you know, after things like when the interest rates went up recently, now people are like, oh, well, the interest rates are what they are. Exactly. They're coming back into the market. But, you know, that we were just recovering in 2019. And then the 2020, the first quarter of 2020 was great. And then, boom, the pandemic came. And people ran like out of the city. I did too. I went out to my house. I have a house on Shelter Island, which is on Eastern Long Island. Mm -hmm. And I just, we just bailed. I was like, we better get our car out of the garage before they close it down. You yeah. know, we can't yeah. get a car out and there's no trains. There's no, you know, I, I was like, people were freaking out. And I have to admit, I was among them. Got in my car and loaded it up with stuff. We went to my wife's office. We looted all of her computer stuff. Just to, you know, the guy at the front desk was like, you can't take that. She goes, oh, yes, I can. I'm taking it right now. Just walked out the door with it all, yeah. you know, jammed it in the car. And off we went to Shelter Island where we then thought, oh, well, spend a month out here. And when this blows over, we'll come back in. Next thing you know, it's like a year later, like crazy. Yeah. So, but that hurt New York more so. Like it, they were, if you had listings in, you know, like New Jersey, close to New York or in Westchester, or parts of Long Island, you had some people had listings that have been on the market for a year 
You know, I, uh, so and now boom, all of a sudden they, they were selling like this. I was going to say, crazy. yeah, my my sister in law is up there, and she moved out of Brooklyn, and they bought a house in Jersey and in West Orange, and it was insane. She was shopping and shopping and shopping, and this had to be a height of height of COVID, right after, right, you know, late twenty two late or mid 22 something like that mid 21 I, I can't remember but yeah everything out there was going over list multiple offers cash was was winning the day everyone was trying to get out of new york so yeah that, that's what she experienced and that's the stories that i've heard from her but yeah and it was uh as as a result you know the the new york market prices went way down at first yeah and once the market reopened, you know, buyers not not immediately, but they started coming back and coming back, and coming back, and you know, they. I had people from Florida who bought apartments in New York because they were like, "Well, oh, God, you're giving them away. Yeah, we'll take it." Uh, compared to Florida, where it was hard to make a deal other than just giving them their ask or more. You know, yeah, uh, it. In New York, it was it was a, a great opportunity for buyers. And then, you know, if you were buying on an investment basis, you were buying at a low number. And all of a sudden, when when everyone started coming back, the rental market went through the roof. Yeah. Because when people first moved to New York or anywhere, really, but in New York, a lot of times, because of the transaction time is quite lengthy in, in Manhattan compared to somewhere else, anywhere else. And so basically, pe most people rent when they first come back, when they first moved to New York. And when all these people started coming back to New York, they rented. So the rental market went through the roof. And if you bought a property as an investment back in you know 2021, beginning of 2021, and and, and you, you just really got lucky because who knew the rental market? The rental market is 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 still out of control in New York. Yeah, because people are coming back to Manhattan. It's it's not you know some people think Manhattan is still dead, but no. Even during the dead times in Manhattan, if you walked outside and walked around, compared to say Cleveland, Ohio, it would just seem like it was on fire. You know, like a lot of activity, but. Because the the place is just so much more active than other places, yeah. uh, Let, you know. You know, it's it's, and now it's back. We're proud to be sponsored by Ridgeline Investment Group. Ridgeline has a track record of transacting more than fifty three million in assets throughout Texas. Ridgeline is currently looking to acquire one hundred to two hundred unit Class B multifamily communities between five and twenty million in San Antonio, Temple, Waco, Tyler, and other Texas secondary markets. To learn more about Ridgeline Investment Group, visit www.ridgelineig.com. Let's talk investments then, because that, that's kind of a transition, people buying the apartments. I know a buddy of mine is in New York, and he was looking at buying his own place uh, when he was up there. But in in general, like I want to take it back because it sounds like you bought early. You were bought some things in in Syracuse. Is that correct? Yeah, my first house purchase act was before it was a nineteen eighty nine ten and three quarters percent interest rate. Yeah, and with very little money down, that thing rented positive. Yeah, but you you know the cap rate up in Syracuse is like eight percent. Cap rate in Manhattan is like. Three percent. Yeah, two, um, three. Yeah, was one um, of those. Yeah, it's a uh, so you can buy a house in Syracuse or a market like Syracuse uh, with a lot less down and still rent positive. New York has this what would I call it a, a built-in expectation of of higher prices in the future. A lot of people buy investment properties. You know, imagining that they'll sell them for significantly more in the future because the track record in Manhattan and in New York City in general is is pretty much, you know, other than, you know, markets go like this. But if you just smooth out that line, you know, it, it yeah. go back to, you yeah. know, the 
1600 just looks like nothing but up, but reality is it gets up and down. But nonetheless, buying, buying for um, appreciation there more so than than the cash flow. Yeah. And also because people want to be in New York and they they look at it as a a safe investment. Like the there's they feel like there's less volatility. Yeah. Um, and there's always a solid rental base. Yeah. Um, and that that's the 3% reflected in that 3% cap rate, not for sure. Yeah, because most people wouldn't take that in other markets. Although now with the price run up in Florida, you know, you're seeing cap rates. You know, I I, am, I live in St. Petersburg and you're seeing cap rates in, in this area, like 4% and stuff and people are buying them. So yeah. it's, you know, it because prices went up so much here. You yeah. know, if you want to place it. it prices and rents down there i've looked at a lot yeah. of offerings over there and it's it's just like the rents have skyrocketed the so rents have skyrocketed yeah. uh, but uh the the numbers aren't as favorable as they were say if you'd bought something in in 2019 even you yeah. know i mean price uh, the price of, of a house uh since 2019 in florida has you know it's not quite maybe it hasn't doubled but it's it's going up a lot more than, in my opinion, more than rents have. So, but, do you have do you have any um, uh, investments like passive investments that uh, produce, you know, consistent cash flow over time? No, you know, not only financial investments. Um, I, I am, my wife and I are exploring the, the Florida market uh, for rental properties, both single families and uh, multifamilies with with us relatively four or less units but what markets we, are you looking at we're, we're looking basically in the st petersburg area so it would be fairly close to our our house here so it'd be easy to manage yeah and basically you know we've looked at a bunch of things and you know it's when prices have gone up a lot you always worry you know, am I buying at the top or, and we've been, I you know as long as I've been in real estate, I worry about that too. Right. So I, but yeah, and you see they're getting snapped up. So the market doesn't feel like in general, cause something's just sitting around cause they're overpriced, but the market feels like, okay, well, prices are up 50%, but rents are up significantly too. And, and you know the the feeling is rents are going to continue to go up, and so the cap rate will come back to where where it becomes uh, a better investment if over time, right? So yeah, I was looking at a, a number of reports, and and it seems like one of the biggest things for twenty twenty three is that affordability is is like uh, an issue, right? And so at, rents have gone up. And it's outpacing the income growth. And so the question in my mind is how long does that actually last? How, how, how long can that happen? And so I was just reading another report this morning and it was like, it's the third month in a row of, you know, rent declines in some markets because mm -hmm. they, they, they've just gone out of control. So I'm curious what you're seeing down there. You know, do you, do you feel as though in St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Tampa, that whole area, do you feel like that's a, an issue? Because I know one oh, market, so, Jacksonville, is definitely on the affordable side, but compared to like a Tampa or St. Petersburg, like how does that look? It, affordability is a huge issue here. I mean, it's a big factor. I mean, because uh, as you say, incomes, you know, they went up a little bit, but not much. Uh, and rents have gone up a lot. So, you know, it's certainly... I understand that not everybody can buy something, Right. But it certainly makes people feel like, God, I wish I'd bought something. You know, yeah. it's the, because when you buy a place, you're 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 locking in. You know, but when you rent, you're at the whim of the market every year. So, I see more negotiability in in prices, and I see, you know, some rental units. Like I, these these houses that are for sale and and for rent. I mean, in the area that I've seen that they've been for rent for for quite a while. So 
you see the market relaxing a little bit, but not so much on on price yet. Uh, yeah. You know, prices to purchase have still gone up in in St. Petersburg and the Tampa Bay area. You know, so it's not like it, they've gone down. So I don't think rental prices in the area have not gone down yet here. So, and then I got to be honest, in New York, rental prices definitely have not gone down there either. So, and those are the two markets that I'm follow that I'm expert in, which, you know, Tampa Bay and, and New York. And I would have to say, I don't see any sign of rent relief in either of those places. Especially if, you know, it, it, how's the population trend in Tampa area? Because if that's oh, increasing, yeah, if it's increasing and your, yeah. your home prices are increasing, there's no... Yeah. The only alternative is to rent if you can't buy. And so obviously that's going to put upper pressure on the limited number of units. Absolutely. And the interest rates have really forced people into continuing to rent. And it's a factor. You know, affordability has been squeezed both in rent and in purchasing. And, you know, houses in Florida... I used to think, oh, I'll sell my place on Long Island. I'll move to Florida and put money in the bank. Forget about that. That's not happening now. You know, unless you're, I have a waterfront place in the Hamptons or something. I'm sure I have like middle of Long Island house and you're going to sell it and move to Florida. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't expect a big price oh. cut. You know, I wouldn't expect to be pocketing piles of money. You think it's like an um, even trade almost? Yeah, for, for a house. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, in New York, of course, it's a different game because New York prices as relaxed as they are compared to the peak, which was in 2015, it's still way, way higher than yeah. other markets. So if you sell your place in New York and you move to Florida, you know, you'll certainly have some buying power. Well, so let's let's talk a little bit more about you, you, what you guys are looking for, because I'm curious, like on the investment side and you're looking for one to four units this is basically what you're looking at. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's we have some cash, and we're, you know, it's what we would do is thinking of buying a a few single family homes, or you know, or a couple of multifamilies. We're, you know, it's just a, a numbers game, you know, in the investment world, purchase price, you know, taxes, insurance, yeah, and so the thing about a single family home, though, is you don't have to worry about neighborly strife. You know, you know, the the two neighbors that don't get along, the dog is barking, the kids are screaming, the person next door is irritated. In a single family home, you know, you don't have that, you know, interaction of people within your property. Yeah. So, and we, you know, our feeling is that those homes um, are stickier in terms of tenants moving in and then staying for longer. You know, they they develop a sense of home, a feeling that, uh, that it's their home and stuff, and they're likely to stay in the in the rental longer. And certainly, turnover costs money. Yeah, right. It's free. You got painting. You got touch ups. You got vacancy. So having a stable tenant that stays for a while um is you know critical you know a lot of people in florida are, depending on the community where you live buy things for short short-term rentals you know doing airbnbs and that kind of stuff and there is a huge market for that down here in st petersburg uh, and lots of the area around the tampa bay communities don't allow short-term rentals and there's some that do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, managing one of those short-term rentals is a is like a full-time job, right? It becomes less passive. I've, I've talked to a number of people that do that. And then if you if you do hire somebody, it's usually about 30% of the of the rents go go to the management company. But they take care of it. I mean, that's for like a white glove service. Uh, yeah, you gotta get cleaning every time someone yeah. leaves, you're cleaning of you know, yeah. towels, uh, you know, all this stuff. Well, but nonetheless, so the the numbers look good. For sure. Yeah. So what's the goal, you and the wife? What are you guys talking about? Why why buy anything and and what you know, are you just trying to get some capital? Get some, you know, just 
to to have passive income so that it's income that um one if you you know with depreciation you can zero out your income everyone always talks oh donald trump doesn't pay any taxes whatever obviously we're not in that category but the reason is depreciation you know you have these assets and over time you're depreciating them and then you have this income that come from those assets and if the depreciation hits that income number there's zero taxes to be paid on that income for sure so that's attractive to us for sure and so you know we would initially buy with cash and then depending on how those numbers are working out you know hit the place with a little financing so that then we would take that money and you know buy something else so yeah um, so are you looking so you're looking at the one to four and you're going to pay cash uh like in san antonio just for example right i mean and and investing in general like there's a one percent rule when you're talking about the the rents to cover debt but if you're not if you're not putting debt on it that changes the dynamic a little bit and you're really buying on that cap rate because that that is really what you're buying right and so for anybody listening, cap rate is the capitalization rate, essentially what your return is on the capital you invest in a deal. So if the cap rate is 5%, you buy a 5% property, you're going to get 5% return. That's like what you're buying, essentially. So what what type of return are you looking for on a cash deal? Well, um, what are you seeing, I guess? what's available, it, you know, most of the places that we're seeing are coming between four and a half and Five and a half. Some of them are even lower. We're not interested in those places. Um, yeah. You know, and everyone is saying, "Oh, well, you know, you can increase your return with just jacking up the rents." I mean, that's a nice. That's a every single property says that. Yeah. You know, in Florida, but the reality is, that you get a pro forma, pro forma rent. You know, roll from people, and it's it seems very optimistic to me compared to the current rent roll, which is, in my opinion, more accurate. Because you say would say to the person, I, I say to them, well, why haven't you jacked up the rents? Yeah. And they're, uh, you know, so, you know, that's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it, it's very like standard. I'm looking at a lot of multifamily, like 50 to 200 unit properties. And, and it's, it's kind of the same argument. There's a little bit more leverage there. You have some other things that you can pull on. Uh, but it is, you know, the property's at 60% and then the performa number, 60% occupied. Performa numbers are, you know, 95% occupied with rents $400 higher than they currently are and no CapEx. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Um, right. Yeah. So, yeah. it's an you know, One of the pressures in the Florida area is definitely an insurance that's, it's, it's something that comes as a surprise to people from out of town just the how much insurance is going to be as compared to most other places in the country uh, that don't have the hurricane risk um and just insurance is is something that that you know it's one of your expenses so it pushes down your cap and and then property taxes in florida are higher than most people imagine they're going to be and so if you have someone who's selling a place that they bought quite a while ago and it hasn't been properly reassessed and all that, the number, the amount they're paying in taxes is a lot lower than what you're going to pay. So you really have to do an analysis on, on one, what the taxes are going to be at the price that you're paying, because that's what they're going to turn into the minute you close. Yep. And then uh, the other one is, how much is insurance going to be so is is florida disclosure state on the sale price yeah yeah i mean the sale price is yeah i mean it's i don't Texas know what you mean is a non-disclosure that, state the only way that the the county finds out about it is uh if it was on mls i'm pretty sure they have access to that data but their their assessment is not based on a disclosed sale price oh it sense. definitely is in uh in Florida, yeah. and yes. So, so when, when you're buying it, what what uh, is are you like 
assessing your tax rate at 90% of purchase price, 85, 100%? Like, what does that look like? So basically in Pinellas County, where St. Petersburg is, you're basically looking at 1.8% of the property value in taxes per year. Yeah. But the valuation, how is that number found out that that's based on the sale price? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's no, no like percentage because in Texas, there's no crazy it's, calculation like in New York. Yeah. yeah. Good luck trying to figure out what the tax are going to be. Um, they have a crazy formula. And one, one nice thing about New York too, though, is if you buy a condo, let's say you buy a condo in New York city and, and you know, the person who bought it, who, who, who you're buying it from, paid 500,000 quite a few years ago. And now you're paying a million, let's say, just for toss out a number. And then you close, your taxes don't change on that condo. So that's a nice thing about yeah. you know, New York is that, you know, you can see what the taxes are and that's what the taxes are going to be for a condo. Not to say that they're going to stay that way forever because taxes only go in one direction. And we know what that is up, right? So... But that's one of the nicer things about New York is an actual New York City taxes are actually quite low. You know, people always talk about, oh, New York's got high taxes. Well, in New York City, the tax rate, you know, tax for like the value of the investment is actually pretty low compared to uh, other Florida. Yeah. But if you went to Westchester, where tax rate is quite high, or you know, some other parts of New York State, then you'd find that um, taxes are actually higher on a per on value basis. So yeah, but I, I want to get to something before we 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 jump off the phone. Uh, basically, getting back to again the the goals. Like I'm, I'm I want to flush something out with you just just out of curiosity. Um, what is it, I guess, why one to four just for management issues, right? Or have you guys looked at larger apartments that maybe? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have. We There's one, an eight, an eight unit building that a friend of mine who we sail with is a commercial broker he just put on the market. And it, it looks very interesting. And, you know, we're putting some thought into it. So it's not like it is a lot has to do with if we want to pay cash, then, you know, there's only how much cash you have, you know? Yeah. Um, and then how much cash you have, how many units could you buy with that cash if you were going to finance and still have a, you know, a positive rate of return, oh. you know, because we don't want to do this and have no return. Yeah. You know what I mean, put 60% financing on something and not make any money debt over your head right yeah. so what's the point of it we're, we're looking now you know really toward just having cash flow and and you know if i i don't i'm not down on bigger properties but you know i'm just focused on what we can afford uh I, based that, on the money that we have yeah i guess the i guess the the question is again on the on the goal is the goal to have the cash flow so that's what it sounds like you want you want to start yeah. offsetting some of your active income with some passive income so like, right and then we'll hit the we'll hit the properties with some financing because let's say that you're getting a rate of return and you have your you have your depreciation right and it's eating up most of the return but not all of it yeah well i look at that the rest of it is something that I would put financing on to zero it out so that there's no yep. tax liability from the income from that property. Yep. Um, and then take that money, whatever that number is, and add it to the money that we have to buy the next place, you know? Yep. So, but certainly uh, the idea is cash flow. I mean, why else do people buy investment properties? Otherwise, we should put the money in the bank uh, yep. nowadays because you, now you can get. You can get a four percent rate of return in a, in the bank these days. Risk free rate, yeah. Um, Fed funds, are, yeah. So I, I guess the reason again, it there are I know a number of people who are are high income earners and they don't want any more income. They just want everything to be so they don't want the cash flow. A couple I know they bought a it was like a hundred thirty six unit deal. They were the main equity in the deal with another sponsor who was actually running it. 
and their instructions were do not send us checks reinvested in the property. So mm -hmm. their goal was not to get cash flow. They wanted the depreciation from that asset um, to offset their active income. And they didn't want any more passive income coming in. They were like, just, just instead of us putting more money in the deal, renovate the units with the cash flow that the property's producing over time and we'll turn everything over and then we'll we'll have this thing for a while. Um 1031 it and and that was their their goal. So again, that, that's kind of the question. There are a number of different properties or types of things that you can invest in if you want completely hands off. And so when I'm when I say larger property, I was I was kind of alluding to maybe like a syndication or a fund. And if you invested your dollars into like a syndication where you're going to get the the big depreciation, year one depreciation plus the ongoing that that happens over time through a K1. But you know, have you guys looked at that? Because that's truly hands off. Yeah, we haven't really focused on that, honestly. It's no. something we could explore for sure. Um, but it's not it hasn't been our focus. Uh so yeah. Do you know do you know what a cost segregation is? No. Okay. So if you're buying, I would say, I would say, start exploring it. Um, there's a, I had a guy on, his name is uh, Weiss. Uh, first name's failing me right now, but he's the cost seg king. If you look him up on, on LinkedIn and uh, mm -hmm. he's basically what a cost segregation is. They take your, all the, uh, all the fixtures in a property and they, they can break, they, it's an engineering analysis. They break down the lifespan of certain things into year one, into five year, into into the regular depreciation, 15 years, something like that. And so you can, as a real estate professional, take 100% of, uh, I think it's 80% now, bonus depreciation in year one for certain items. And so your depreciation in year one goes up significantly when you, when you acquire and put it something into service. And so uh, definitely, if you're looking at four units, you can do it on a single family, but it's not like there. It, it costs money to do these things, and so you'd have to actually talk to a guy like like God. I can't believe I'm failing his name. The the cost egg king. <laughs> so you you just talk to him and say, look, this is the type of property I'm looking at. It doesn't make sense to do it a, um, a cost seg on this property, but I, I, on a four unit, anything like that size, I imagine it'd be well worth the money to do that. So you can accelerate the appreciation up into year one. And so more of the dollars that you're investing in that year are going to be depreciated and you're going to get, you're going to get a bigger write-off in that year. And if you don't use it all, then it carries over with you. It stays with you into the following year, subsequent years. So again, when you're, t when you're talking, and the reason I'm asking you about the goals is kind of like a real life question answer sort of deal just that I, that I have with a lot of people. Um, it's like, do you want complete uh, passive and, and maybe a syndication where they're running this, this sort of investment program on a 100, 200, 500 unit. I mean, these things, whatever it is, it doesn't even have to be multifamily. Um, it could be storage facilities. It could be whatever, but then they, they are running the project. You invest 50, hundred thousand, whatever with, with that sort of deal. And then you get, uh, you get the depreciation the same as you would, if you bought a single family, you know, they're, they're going to do a call seg on that deal. And then they send you a, uh, here's your depreciation. Your cash flow should be, you know, five to 10% annual cash flow, boom. And then you're going to get a 14% return total over the five-year hold. So I just went through a lot of stuff there, but the idea of finding, and, and if you if you like the real estate and you want to run it and you get a kick out of having the single family and you guys want to be able to touch it, feel it and, and all of that in your local market, that's a completely personal like strategy that you are making for yourself. But those other investments, if you want to diversify and have maybe four or five different sponsors that you work with, um, maybe four or five different asset classes, you can put fifty to one hundred thousand dollars with a bunch of different people, different markets, and that sort of thing. Get the get the cash flow, get the depreciation, and you're really hands off. You're looking at spreadsheets and reports and that sort of thing. So yeah. Anyway, I just didn't know if you had looked into that as as an option or if you were familiar with those. Yeah, I mean, I I, I have friends who you know put people together um, and buy hundred hundreds of units, you know, complexes with two, 300 property, you know, apartments in it. And with rising rents and all that stuff, it's turned out well for them. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I haven't 
been thinking about that really. And maybe I should, uh, because it's really hands off. Whereas, you know, if you have a single family and all of a sudden the sink is leaking, you know, Eric, your phone will ring. Eric, get out of here. I've been through this before, you know, and some people run over and fix things themselves. And and there was a time when I when I was in Syracuse that I would do that. And but I'm not looking to do that now. But I have a team of, you know, I, I have people that I now I have because of my business down here, I have I know plumbers, electricians, whatever, you know, I have all the basic things that I would pay people to do. And I have some fairly responsive people in my toolbox, which you know is important. So yeah, it, it, it definitely makes it easier for you being in the business to do those, those, to buy those single families and to buy those fourplexes and that sort of thing. I would think, because again, I've done that. That's, that's like the, the, my background, but again, it always comes back to me. I'm like, okay, what's the goal? What are you guys trying to do? And then honing in on that. And then, and then you could obviously make your investment decisions based around that. Yeah, and part of it is positioning ourselves to just have cash flow um, in retirement. You know, um, I'm not ready to retire right now or something, but if I if I accumulate, you know, a number of properties that produces cash flow, then although I ha- I will say this, I do have a pension from the newspaper, but it's measly. Yeah, you know, it, it's a pension nonetheless, and yeah. I'm not going to turn my nose up at it. But, but as a real estate broker, we're not like police officers or teachers. You know, we don't have a a pension. You know, no one's going to give me any money if I stop working. You know, I'll be living off of my 401k and my IRA and all these assets I've accumulated over time. But. It's literally in here as a what? A, how are you set up for retirement? Was one of my next questions. <laughs> no. Yeah, and you know we're we're in good shape for retirement. You know, it's we're we have good financial assets, but you know, with financial assets, when you and it, when you hit a certain point with your IRA, when you have to take deductions, you have to take you have to take money out of it, That's right? Crazy. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, we'll have that money, we'll have Social Security, whatever. I'll have my pension from the newspaper. My wife has a little bit of a pension from her work. But, um, you know, the bottom line is that it would be nice to have, you know, a separate cash flow, you know, that that supports our lifestyle. So, you know, as you discussed, as we talked about earlier, you know, I'm a sailor. You know, I'm, I'm a sailboat racer predominantly. And, you know, I think if you've ever heard about sailboat racing, it's, it's not an inexpensive idea. But, um, you know, I know who knows how long I'll be racing for when I'll, you know, switch to cruising or whatever. But, um, you know, just uh, to maintain our lifestyle while no longer working, because, you know, if you have a high income and then you stop working, you know, I have a lot of friends who are like, oh, I'm going to retire. And then two years later, they're back, you know, because as a broker, quite honestly, you know, you could work forever. Not that you want to, but but it's hard to say no to a juicy listing. It really is. It, and so, you know, that's one of the nice things about also about being a real estate broker is that I don't want to say you can't get fired, but you know, you, you really, you're an independent contractor, you know, and I'm a broker. So if I, you know, wanted to go out on my own, hang my own shingle, I could, you know, so yeah. um, I don't have a job, so to speak, where I have to be somewhere and that kind of thing. So you can continue to work, you could cut back if you wanted to. I don't want to cut back, really. I just want to sell, sell, sell. It's just my nature. <laughs> no, baby, sell. ABC. <laughs> so, but, but you got to figure like, you know, you get to a certain age, you may not want to continue doing yeah. that. Well, I will say, I just, I sold this place in, uh, in Florida recently and the buyer's agent, I was representing the seller and the buyer's agent was we were doing the inspection in the 
he, he said, oh, I ate some bad sushi. My mother's going to come and she's going to be there for the inspection. I, okay, fine. He he said, you'll enjoy meeting her. She's, she's like, I think he said it was 85 years old or something. I said, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. And she was like a whippersnapper. I mean, she was like, she was so full of energy. She's like, yeah. you know, she still loves selling properties. She's she's licensed in a bunch of places. She's licensed in Dubai. I'm like, well, who, oh, that's wow. crazy, yeah. you know? And, you know, it, he said, you know, it keeps her energetic and alive, you know, yeah. to keep uh, keep selling. And, and she loves it. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you can keep doing this until whenever but you know it'd be nice to be able to relax at some point and that's where the path of income comes in honestly that you know if you have a bunch of keys and that was my my intention when i was in syracuse was i was going to buy more and more and more multifamily properties but you know then i decided to move to new york so <laughs> yeah do you, do you guys have a goal on on either like the finance like i want x number of dollars coming in from these investments on a monthly basis or it's really just like we're just doing this to put capital to work so it's not just sitting in the bank exactly yeah we uh, we we it was just to you know six months ago if you had cash you know it's like worthless i mean i don't say worthless you, you you couldn't make any money with cash because there was no yeah um you couldn't just put it in the bank and get a return uh, you'd get like you know half a percent or whatever it was yeah. but all of a sudden now um you're seeing money markets at four and a half percent and stuff that uh, mind you, you pay tax on that money, right? So you can't disappear with depreciation. So it's not your your the money that you pocket will be less if you're in the bank at at four and a half percent than if you have a four and a half percent cap on a real estate investment. Yeah. So yeah, you get the tax benefit, you get the long term appreciation. Yeah, all the all the reasons to yeah uh, yeah. And then you know ultimately you know if you get tired of that too. You can always just sell the properties, you know, it's just a, a long-term goal of having, having income. That's all. Yeah. For us. Yeah. Pretty simple, you know? Yeah. It's, you, it's again, I have the benefit of talking to a lot of different people and different stages of their, their careers. Um, I, I talked to like a 21 year old guy the other day, killing it. He's doing really well. And so his investment horizon is completely different than yours. Right. You have been successful. Your wife's been successful. You guys are are at a certain stage where you're like, okay, we can just put some money to work. We have, we have some things. He is. I, I need to get ten houses a year, and I need to be cash flowing this much per house. I want to be like set up myself up so that in ten years, this is what it looks like. And so it's just again interesting to see the the difference, um, the different different paths that people are, are looking at. Uh, but for you, I, I would, if, if you know somebody, if you have friends that are are looking at putting together, it sounds like they're syndicating a deal to buy these 200 unit complexes. You might just have that conversation. And if you want to have it with me offline, happy to have that conversation too, just to, to like, I, I think in the first five episodes I go through and, and there's 50 questions you can ask a syndicator, right. To like <laughs> things, things to know about a deal. Uh, but it may be not the only option, right. Don't just do one, but if you're buying a house and then you've got an extra 50,000 just sitting around, you may be able to put it into one of these syndication deals that if you like the person that's putting it together, you like the property, you like the asset. And that's just another way to diversify a little bit, typically like a five-year time horizon on those things. Uh, but you're looking to double your money. That's the, the premise, you know, double your money in five years. And that's, that's what you're looking to do. You know, I've had some clients who've done 1031s where they have some money left over from the 1031 and they put it into one of those yeah. syndicated things because they need to get rid of it. Yep. And so you can do that with a portion of that. And I I've, you know, you know, I, I know those people have have done it, but I haven't I've never done it, you know. Yeah. So but it is interesting. Um yeah. Don't, uh, I guess, negate it or don't not think about it. It's one of those things that just uh, um, cursory look at it may give you the, the like, yeah, I want to try this or no, I don't. It's not for me. But um, 
Harry, we've we've covered some ground here. I'm, I appreciate you jumping on, and and it's it's great getting to know you better. I want to ask you a few things not related to business, and we'll wrap it up, and we'll go from there. So, what's your favorite pastime? I think I may know from looking and talking to you. What's your favorite pastime not related to business? Uh, sailing. You know, yeah, I, it's my uh, addiction. I saw, I saw. So on your on your screen on uh, on LinkedIn, I've got you've got these compass sales. So is that something you put together, or is that the the company has that? The right. sales on the sailboat. Yeah, yeah. Photoshop did that. Nice, <laughs> my man. That's very cool. Okay, nah. I didn't know if you if you had a like a company company boat that you guys took out and raced around or not. No, um, you know, they're in my in my amateur sailing world, taking money from sponsors and whatnot is um you, there's classifications of sailors and and if you take money you end up becoming a professional sailor got it and then there's like an r an r class of boats so J j105 you know I, I could be a professional sailor on the boat but everybody else can and it's a long story but no i haven't uh i have other friends who have you know, put logos on their sales before and have take gotten free sales for putting, you know, a company logo on it. But you're you're getting on the edge of professional yeah. sailing. Yeah. What's um, your favorite sailing event? Uh, pre- that's hard to say. I, I like uh, you know class races, so one where everyone has the same boat, um, one design they call it in our sailing world so one design sailing because then you don't have to grovel about the ratings and oh they have a good rating i have a bad rating i have the same boat yeah but but i like also like distance racing where you know it's more navigational races versus so class races tend to be you go around buoys like this windward lures yeah and and Boats are really close together and it's very exciting. And, and in our, in our, like we're doing block Island race week. And I, I think there's like 30 J one Oh five signed up for it. So it'll be 30 of the same exact boat on the line all at once. And they're 35 feet. So they're not little tiny boats. Um, so it'll be exciting. Uh, we, we like that. And, but we like to do, you know, races where you go from one place to another. And so, yeah, and I'm, uh, my other passions are uh, are cooking. I love to cook. I do. I used to work in a restaurant, long, in restaurants, not just one, but a long time ago in my teenage years and in, into college. And I cook table side at one restaurant. But I I like cooking, and and then uh, I'm a pilot. So I saw um, that too. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I'm sort of a dormant pilot. Right now, I mean, my license is current and I have a current medical certificate, but I haven't really been flying um, mostly because, you know, there's only so many hours in the day and my free time is going towards sailing. And I like cars, too. I have a few different cars. So How do your, but, hands, your hands and some things. Yeah. Yeah. Those are my things. Those are my main things. All uh, right. What what's the best thing that's happened to you or your family in the last sixty days or so? Recent memory. Uh, past sixty days, best thing that's <laughs> happened. It's hard to say. You know, I, I'm I'm pretty lucky. I got to be honest. So I guess a lot of good things have happened. Um, you know, we've really just been enjoying our our Florida scene. Although I'm a commuter, I go back and forth to New York, but. Um, I can't think of any sort of like one event that's happened. That's, that's all right. Uh, so enjoying the Florida time. That's all right. So <laughs> what na- name one or two people who've been most influential in either your success or the way you think. So in terms of my, you know, cause I have these two different careers, you know, uh, that I had done, but um, in terms of like my photography thing, um, and in my move into management, you know, there was this a publisher of the newspaper up in Syracuse. This guy, Steve Rogers, was really supportive of me and, you know, paid for my MBA. And and he was a big, I would say, a, had a big a positive effect on my career then. And also, you know, as time went on, that 
MBA and all that stuff really helped me position myself in in real estate. In terms of like real estate, uh, this guy that taught me how to sell stuff, Jerry Weinstein, was a huge early impact on me. Although I haven't spoken to him in years now. And then, and then the woman that hired me at Douglas Elliman, this woman, Karen Duncan, um, she really believed in me and thought I was would make a great broker. And when I was really just starting out, I'd only been in the in the business for a few months when she brought me over to Douglas Elliman. But I think you know, she had a big impact on my real estate career, really supportive of my of my move into brokerage and you know, could see the the, the potential for ta- in my talent for dealing with people and my gift of of gab or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Harry, again, it's been great having you on and chat with you, getting to know you more and hearing your journey, your story and talking investments. So uh, catch you guys on the next episode. Did you know that 80% of the agents we speak with got into real estate in order to gain passive income so they could obtain financial freedom and become work optional? If you want to stay up to date, the best way is to make sure you're subscribed. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and do it now. We'll catch you on the next episode.